Welcome to Unmasked. I'm Ron Bennington. This Unmasked was done at Caroline's Comedy Club in New York City with uh, Dane Cook. Everybody's familiar with Dane's career because I don't know if you can go any higher than what Dane has done in his career. Uh, He took it up about as far as you can go and then uh, had to weather the blowback, the backlash that happens sometimes with that kind of success. And as soon as they kind of knock you off that perch, people start coming from everywhere. But I thought Dane was very, very interesting and upfront and honest. There was none of his kind of stage arrogance as he talked about his life. And you could see that he was just a really driven guy. Some people are driven to succeed, to go further than they can even think. I always think of... There's certain people, Kevin Hart is another guy I would put in this, is no matter what business that you would have put him into, Dane would have been successful because he would have willed himself to be successful. He was going to outwork everybody. And he also has that really great, great Boston background. So he came up with a tribe of people and a, a class of people that were, you know, seniors when he was freshmen who were just great comics, just real killers and if you can bust your way through that you're going to find out who you are by the end of it so i think you're going to find this interesting i'm ron bennington and this is unmasked with dane cook i love it (laughs) <laughs> I feel like everybody's like, let's move it along. I'm on my lunch break here. I got to yeah. get back. And <laughs> I, I do want to point out that anyone who drinks in the afternoon is an alcoholic. Because, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of beers on the <laughs> cover. Look is. at this. It's like yeah. a pirate's den over here. It is. Thank this- you very much, everybody, for being a part of this today. This means a lot. It's great to see you all. Thank you. Ron, well, thank you. This is uh, a cool time for you because this is the first special in how long? Uh, the uh, Almost four years. Four years? Yes. Four years. And this one you did yourself. I did, yeah. It was the first time I've ever uh, gone into the, uh, put on the director's hat yeah. and decided to come at, you know, come at this entirely from, you know, aesthetically what I would hope, uh, you know, it could look like as well as how the material would be, uh, you know, brought to the people. So... And where that came from was really interesting. I got to know Jerry Lewis a couple of years ago. I went and saw Jerry at, uh, he had a uh, documentary opening from uh, Method of the Madness. Mm-hmm. And his daughter, Danielle, was a big fan of mine. Um, Hi, how are you guys doing over here? Sorry, you're on the, they're like, <laughs> ah, we're in the nosebleeds over here. <laughs> his daughter, Danielle, was uh, kind enough to introduce me to him. And he had uh, become a fan of my comedy through his daughter, who was showing in my clips. So we exchanged numbers, and I didn't think I'd ever get a phone call from <laughs> Mr. Jerry Lewis. But I did, and he became uh, a mentor. A mentor, and I really uh, needed one at that time in my life. My own mentor from high school had passed away, and I was really kind of looking for somebody in my life who, who got it, you know, and understood the comedy road and, you know, all the turmoil and ins and outs that kind of go with that. And he was the person who said, you, you got to start, you know, believing in yourself and in, in directing because nobody knows better than you. And that's obviously how he, that was his big claim to fame as he dominated the world. And it gave me the guts to finally do this. And I'm psyched it's finally here. Now, you, you feel that you, that you always need somewhat of a mentor or a coach in your life? I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I like now that uh, I'm kind of that guy. You know, there's a whole new gang of, you know, the new squad of young comics. Yeah. And I, I, you know, I let them know. I said, listen, I've been through it all. I've been through the spanking machine enough. I've been through, <laughs> I've had some uh, pretty good high water marks, And I think I can help you traverse some of that. And so now I like being that guy that comics call and say, what's this one page contract they want me to sign? I'm like, no, 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 no. Those are the worst ones. The ones that are like half a paragraph or, uh, you know, really, you, yeah. you, you got to be careful. So yeah, it, it's, it's been an interesting, I'm in that, uh, you know, kind of great uh, act two of my life where I get to have, um, you know, people I'm a fan of and want to emulate 
in my life, and then I get to help some of these young bucks that are out there doing so it. So it really does feel like an act two to you right now. It does. It you know, like... when I hit 40, it was yeah. like, all right, so I'm in that act two of my career, which started when I was, you know, 19. This is my 24th year doing stand-up comedy now, and um, I know, it's crazy. It's, it's wild. A lot of people like numbers. It's unbelievable. Uh, and so I looked at it like that. It was like, all right, so I'm starting this new phase of my life and, you know, everything, just, you know, relationships and how, you know, I'm not a kid anymore. I'm not the kid in the black tank top who, you know, is going <laughs> to pour water on himself. And, uh, and yet uh, those were, you know, great memories. But what do I want to do now and what do I want to do uh, in the future, which is, you know, more stuff like this, directing and then maybe even uh, directing and producing young comedians and helping them to keep their... Um, you know, to keep their identity. That would be my goal if I can help young comics is to like, you know, help them to get away from the stuff that's going to, uh, you know, make them look uh, milk toast and try to help them, you know, hold on to their authenticity. Well, you're a, you're a Boston guy and you can always tell the Boston guys because they go out of their way to be different from everybody else. Who was who was the class that you came in with? Okay, well, when I was coming out of Boston, I started in 1990, and we had like the we had like a gang of guys back there who were really, uh, I think, the best of the best. And they, you know, it was during the boom, the big comedy boom of the 80s. And you had guys in Boston like Steve Sweeney and Don Gavin and DJ Hazard and Stephen Wright. And I would go in night after night, uh, and I would watch them at uh, the Comedy Connection in in Boston. Uh, there was also a place called Stitches which is one of the first places I performed. And I would see these guys, and I looked at them as they were men that did comedy. They were guys. They were really, really just, they could be tough. They could be a little scary, intimidating. And I liked that swagger. I liked that attitude because I was very silly, and I liked being uh, fantastical and imaginative. But part of me was like, I think you could you could still be a guy. You can still uh -huh. have some you know some balls up there, and you know be a little bit uh, of a presence. Uh, and so I learned a lot coming up under under those uh, those fellows. And they always said a thing up there that go out and find yourself. Uh, and I've had I remember Bill Burr was on the show, and he was telling me when he came in, he goes, "You had Dane Cook being really big on stage and killing, and then Patrice O'Neill being really still on stage." and killing right. and he was like how the fuck do you do this how <laughs> how's this whole thing supposed to work out because all you guys went out of your way like i said to be individuals we did you know i came up with uh, bill burr and uh, you know new patrice uh, you know we we all started uh, within the same year or two and we were all trying to carve out like what's our what's our voice and how can we distinguish ourselves from these Honestly, like masters, these, the, you know, right. uh, you'd watch them every night and, and at some point you'd be like, all right, and then I'm going to quit tonight. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is like, yeah. <laughs> this is unacceptable. I'm never going to be this funny. And it, it, but that was great because it also propelled all of us to want to figure out how to, how to win, mm. you know, really how, you know, that competitive, maybe Boston uh, spirit of being like, I got to win, especially coming to New York City at some point, being like, how do I go into New York City as a Boston kid and figure out a way to belong here where, uh, you know, where it's it's absolutely, you know, the the, the comedy mecca of the, mm -hmm. the world, uh, you know, all the good stuff comes out of this this point. So it took a lot of years and I'm glad I came up with that group of guys. But was there any times that you, when you were saying when you're young, you were thinking about quitting, but does that happen along the road? Do you go... I don't know. Yeah, especially yeah. along the road. Yeah. I think you know that. Like, <laughs> There's some times when you're out there in the middle of, uh, you know, middle of nowhere. You, you, you know, the thing I remember that about that, too, is like whenever you're at the worst time as a comic on the road, you're also in the shittiest car you've ever driven. <laughs> I had a Chevy Cavalier, mm. and it had four different <laughs> tires on it, and one of them was like the one in the trunk <laughs> that's for like emergencies only yeah and i was taking that sucker to like orno maine which is <laughs> yeah. you know 19 hours up so it, always in those uh those moments of uh despair you're kind of driving to these gigs and you're making uh you know you're losing money somehow by the time you get out of there there you're, you're down uh, a few bucks you're eating horribly you know you're eating the same fast food place on the way back that you stopped <laughs> it on the way up um and yet there's something in uh you know in several of us that that says man i really just need this i need this whatever this hole is that i'm trying to fill um it only feels right when i'm on stage somewhere in front of people trying to connect but it is a hole somewhere. There's something that you feel 
almost missing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a great acting teacher named Larry Moss, and I, I, I somebody gave me a gift for one of my birthdays. He he's like he works with like the bit. He's like the Oscar guy. That's mm -hmm. like his nickname. You know, he works with people, prepares them for their Academy Award moment. And I was just going to do a seminar one on one one with him. <laughs> and I sat down to have a conversation, and he was like one of those people that instantly he was just you knew that he was just like a ninja at what he did, and 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 psychology and human behavior, and you just knew he. Immediately, there was a simpatico with him and I when we sat, and we're not even 10 minutes into the conversation, and he just said to me, he's like, he's like, Dane, the hole inside of you. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, the hole, we all got the hole, right? <laughs> and, he's like, and he said to me, he goes, and, and he started getting emotional. I could see him welling up. And then just his, you know, just whatever this truth was that, you know, connecting with me, he said, you're never going to fill that hole. <laughs> And he said, and this really was, it made an impact on me. He goes, you're never going to fill it. He goes, so show it to people. Don't be afraid to own it and stand right next to it. These are the things that, you know, gutted me. This is my hole. And that's when I started really changing in my comedy. Uh, you know, I started uh, talking more about, you know, personal issues. When, when my parents were sick with cancer, I brought it to the stage. And it was a place to find humor in it, but it was also cathartic. And I did. I ended up doing a routine about after my mom passed away two years later of deleting her number from my uh, cell phone. And that was a really difficult uh, piece to bring to the stage. But once I did and I shared it with people, and then people, you know, could say to me like, that happened to me too. You know, I lost my sister. I lost my aunt. I lost, you know, lost my son. And that, that moment to me, coupled with what Larry told me, uh, I think changed how I wanted to present myself as a person and a performer. Before then, you would have protected yourself from that. Oh, yeah. I would have yeah. just, I would have jumped on a table, acted like <laughs> dinosaur. I would have, uh, it was really just, yeah. you know, you know, it was like maniacal. I remember doing like early gigs and having club owners say things like, uh, I don't want to have him back here. Why? Because I got to clean everything up after <laughs> he broke tables, yeah. you know, nine glasses were smashed. I was really just trying to do anything and everything, probably just to kind of look at me, you know, pay attention to me. Yeah. And yet I was getting laughs and I was certainly different from what Patrice was doing <laughs> and what Bill was doing and some yeah. of my, uh, my comrades at that time. Uh, but it's what I needed to do at the beginning. You know, it's kind of like you fail forward sometimes. You can sure. really be like, I'm succeeding, but maybe not always with the right set of tools at yeah. that time well the difference is a lot of guys will go out have something that they're getting a laugh with and then keep it the rest of their <laughs> lives <laughs> right you have like that batman joke and you're always hoping another one is made so you can dust it off and you're like great yeah they're making a new batman movie i can bring back that chunk for another four years <laughs> but you know early on that you got to drop it right you felt that yeah uh yes i started um, I really, that was kind of like my philosophy, I would say about the last 10 or 12 years. Once I have an album, once I have a special, I start of the new year, I'm going to be a new comic again. It's going to be a brand new five minutes and I'm just going to have to figure it out and take as long as I need to from that point forward. And, uh, that feels right now. It feels good to just, uh, spend as little time in crafting it. Uh, just, you know, be honest, get to the truth quick. And then, you know, put all the little facets, you know, all the cadences and the comedy tools that you need to put in there and then share it with the people and move on. It's it's the only art form that you would do that. I mean, the Stones would never say, we're dropping <laughs> that jumping jack flash shit, <laughs> you know. Well, well, if they do, I would, I would be happy to uh, pick that up if they're, uh, if they're through with that. Yeah. But uh, isn't that strange? It's the only place that people say, grow, be new. Be different. And, and it's, it's, it's difficult to do. It's hard to do because once you have that uh, rapport through mm -hmm. that piece of material, it's hard because uh, you know it's going to work. You right. know, it's, it's, it's going to be, you know, it's riveted. It's solid. But uh, it feels right to finally release that and then move on to the next vantage point in your, you know, in your life. And it doesn't always need to be so serious. It doesn't, for me especially, it's like I'm still... I have youthful exuberance. I feel like the same kid that stepped on stage at 19. I don't feel any different whatsoever at all. And so when I'm on stage, I, I, I want to still be able to, uh, you know, be fantastical and outrageous. But I want to be able to be vulnerable and talk about the things that are uh, poignant uh, to me and hopefully to, you know, the people around me. Well, maybe maybe you keep that because you've been dating girls the same age as you always have. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait a second. Wait a second. I'm... <laughs> 
<laughs> well, there was one piece. I'm not going to give it away, but something you bring up in your new special. I, I can speak on it a little bit. Where some I'm talking about, like just you know, technology, the way we're you know meeting each other through these uh, you know apps and websites, and it's kind of like in that fast food nation that's like we want everything now and our intimacy. I want I want it right now. You know, there's an app Cuddler. I want a hug right now. <laughs> Is there somebody around who wants to you know give me a warm embrace <laughs> next to somebody making you know hot nuts on the side of the street? And there's an app for that. But where that bit came from is I, I took a, a, a young lady. Uh, very young. A, a very young uh, lady. <laughs> on, a, uh, on, a, on a trip. And I took her to Hawaii. And uh, our first day, we were sitting on the beach. And this is where all that texting chunk came from. And as we're sitting on the beach, I don't think she brought her head up from her phone. And I was like, you know, it's gorgeous. It's paradise. I finally said, I was like, what are you texting? And she handed me her phone. And it was emojis of a beach and a sun and a palm tree and people. <laughs> People swimming and, you know, a, a woman dancing in a red dress. And she's like sending these hieroglyphics. And I was just like, wow, this is the modern, uh, you yeah. know, this is the modern age. This is how we're communicating and stuff. So that's where a lot of them, it's steeped, it's steeped from that material from that moment. And that's always LOL, 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 LOL that's yeah. She, and she actually just showed her age by saying that. Yeah, LOL. the LOL generation. Yeah. Generation well, LOL. Maybe that's the next that, one. Maybe that's it. Uh, but, you know, we, we... Everybody told me I had to stuck to my sneaker. I thought it was a trick you I were doing. I thought it was, it was I a no gag. Idea. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait till he uses that piece. Uh, it's going to be great. <laughs> um, so, four years, what do you spend your time doing? In well, okay. So the reason it, it was four years, a couple things. First of all, I, I was on like an eight-year tear. It was really right. eight straight years, uh, and it was it was a lot. It was either me going on to the next, you know, uh, big thing that I, you know, was like, okay, I did Madison Square Garden. What's next? Where, you know, I want to play a space shuttle. I want to do, you know, <laughs> it was charging, 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 and also keeping the plate spinning and keeping my team happy. And and sometimes, you know, you can kind of lose sight of what it is even you want, you know, just for yourself. And next thing you know, you're working for your brand. Right. Um, and I, I got caught up in that as well. And after my folks got sick, because uh, I lost I lost both of my mom and dad to cancer within nine months. Mm. Um, yeah, it, it was it was unbelievable. It was it was impossible. And uh, but we dealt with it through a lot of humor. Uh, we laughed a lot. We shared a lot of memories. And, and I really got to show my my parents um, everything that I wanted to do, they got to really be a part of. And after they were gone, I still kind of kept charging. And I realized uh, at the beginning of 2010 that I had not like grieved, that I had not really stopped. I thought I was fine. I really thought I was fine. I was just like, no, my fans are happy. I'm happy. And I realized I wasn't fine. I realized that I was, uh, you know, really bummed out and really uh, it, it had caught up to me. So I took 2010 off the whole year. And uh, my, my mission statement was, I'm going to work as hard on myself this year as I ever have on my career. And I did. Did therapy, spent time with people that maybe I was always just like on the fly. I can hang with you for a little <laughs> bit and then I got to go. I got a gig. <laughs> and um, it just kind of was like a regular dude for a while, regular square, hung out, you know, wore flip flops <laughs> and, uh, and got bored quite a bit. <laughs> And yet, uh, by the end of that year, I felt like I had worked. I had, I had the, the the next kind of set of tools that I would need to progress forward. I went through some other, you know, personal strife uh, that I had to work out with uh, my brother, who was my business manager. I found out he'd stolen a lot of money from me, and I just had to really finally be um, completely true to myself and like stand on my own uh, and deal with all these things. So once 2010 was over, then I just started in on the new material. I spent that year kind of just getting used to it again, and then it was really the last couple of years, and after I spoke to Mr. Uh, Jerry Lewis, that I, I was like, no, nah, I'm, I'm feeling happier and healthier than I ever have in my life, and I have these great fans, and they're waiting, and they're excited, and they're writing me every day, like, we're waiting here for you, man. It was emotional, yeah. uh, and, uh, but I was good to go, and I knew that the material was, uh, you know, was right on target. So here we are, you know, hours away, finally. But there was a part of you who were thinking, maybe I won't go back. Maybe I've, because you've, you've done probably more than any other comic has ever done in terms of getting big. And if, if it's not you, you're on a very short list of just a couple of names. Uh, so what do you do 
after you've been to the top of the mountain. Sure. Yeah. There's definitely those moments where you're, you're, you're saying, okay, this is, does it need to be bigger? Yeah. And then w what was happening was when I was back in the clubs and I'm just doing, you know, the, the seller again, I'm like, this is actually enough. This actually feels right. as good, honestly, just the visceral reaction and being in the moment. Uh, and so once I kind of allowed myself and, and there was also that chunk of time where I was like, I was really sick of myself. It was like, I was everywhere. And I was kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, I really want to step back. And, and uh, you know, I, I started with a whole new team of people. I just wanted to really kind of downsize everything and make, make things more personal, take a little bit more time, not just sign onto a movie because it's there and have everything be from, you know, me and my passion and my ideas with my guys that I like to, you know, the comics and the Justice League I've formed around me. Mm -hmm. I'd rather work with those people and have something that, you know, may, you know, you know, either make it or not, but on our own uh, laurels. So I did want to stop a couple of times during that year, but uh, never, but only out of fear of getting back up there because that's what happens to us sure. when we're away for a little bit. But once I grabbed on that mic after one year, it was just, uh, you know, it was like, it was, it was on again. I think it's, it's that very few guys have been able to do that. I mean, most of the time people can't afford to take the year off. I, I always laugh when people go, why did somebody pick that movie? And I go, who would turn down a movie? You know what I mean? Like someone brought you a piece of shit movie and offered you millions of dollars. You'd be <laughs> like, yes, the lottery. It's right. a movie. Yes. And then most people are like, what was he thinking? He was thinking he had a fucking movie. He was thinking that's a, a <laughs> lot of money. Yeah. And that also pays the rent. Yeah. And, you know, uh, yeah. You, you know, there was a time in your life where you just got to pay the rent. You know? yeah. And that's why early in the comedy career, you're taking gigs like, you know, I'm working at a place called the Rathskeller, where uh, <laughs> I'm standing on the roof of a hot dog stand <laughs> at, you know, 2 a.m. performing for college kids. Yeah. And that's to pay the rent. What's yeah. that? Ohio. Was that where that was? I'll never go back there. Yeah. Oh, uh, thanks for reminding me. I, the Rat Skeller. Can I just tell you quickly about that gig? This is. I'll make a long story short because I know it. it I, I did the gig. There was literally on the roof of a hot dog stand that they had me performing, and I don't know what was happening this year, but hot dogs were really popular because everybody was during the show. They were walking under me. They didn't turn the hot dog stand off. They kept it as a functional hot dog stand. So people are like watching me as they're walking under. They're buying hot dogs, buying hot dogs. So I get up on the stage, and, or whatever, the roof of the, the hot dog stand, and it's a, it's a debacle. It's bad. It's, there's no lighting on the roof of the hot dog stand. They kept all the arcade games on in the back. Everything is like there's TVs on. People are playing pool and air hockey. They had air hockey, but it was like the loudest air of air hockey. It was like, it was like a thrust. And I'm up there, and I'm, I'm basically, uh, you know, bombing or whatever comedy term. I'm eating my own, you know, you know. And... Um, and about midway through, I, I like, I demanded somebody turn off the arcade games. I was like, I was like, I was like, somebody needs to shut the games off. And somebody flipped a switch. Um, and when everything turned off, everybody was so upset that I made them turn off that all of a sudden hot dogs started coming through the air. <laughs> So many hot dogs. It was like the opening of Saving Private Ryan, but with fucking hot dogs. It's, oh, I'm, 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 I'm back in it right now. My therapy is, this is where therapy sucks because I'm really in it again, Ron. And so I remember hot dog whizzed by my ear and then I remember I, I jumped and a hot dog went under me and a hot dog went under my armpit and like 50 hot dogs came out of the dark. Now I go back to my crappy little wherever I was staying. I don't even think they put me in a motel. I think I was like in a dorm or something like that with students like... And I remember laying in bed, okay, this just goes to show like where your head's at as far as like how crappy my career was at that point. I'm laying in bed and as I'm thinking about the, the gig that I just did, I smiled. I had a big smile on my face and I remember saying to myself, ha ha, not one hot dog hit me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Winner. <Yeah. laughs> but I'm never going back there. Yeah. If I ever have to go back and play the Rathskeller again, I'm really done. <laughs> Pull my comedy license because I'm done, kid. And that, that's, that's, for that's the beauty of it, though, is like there has been no one who's made it without doing those shitty gigs. You know, it's yep. like they will never say to a doctor, you have to operate on people that are really 
<laughs> not going to make it. I have know. two hearts. You know, you're going to be operating in a gas station. Yep. But you have to do that when you're a comic. I just said backstage. I said to my publicist with me all day today, and she's putting up with my craziness. And I said, if I had to go back and do the first 10 years of my comedy career again, or you could offer me to do brain surgery, I'd go brain surgery in a sure. heartbeat. You know, th those beginnings, man, it was, it was a lot of rough times, but I'm fortunate. I have a feeling you'd really be up to try the brain surgery. Too. I'm kind of thinking it might be interesting. I don't <laughs> yeah, know. Maybe I think you pull it off. I think I could do it too. Yeah. I know about the cerebellum. <laughs> sure. Yeah, it's near you the limbic play. system. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> and if the guy doesn't make it, don't pay you. What do you care? <laughs> Just give him a chance. That's all he wants. You you know, Jerry Lewis used to go in and watch surgeries all the time. He always talked about that. I, I had heard about that. I'm going to have yeah. to ask him if that, what, what was... Uh... He would go in and like, there'd be open heart surgeries and he'd be like looking real close. Yeah. Like, Lady! You know, he's, just he's... so excited. I went to his show the other night again. Mm -hmm. He was, per, you know, he's still performing. He's still doing his... If you have a chance to see Jerry Lewis, uh, you know, he goes out, he does this, uh, you know, he'll come out. He's 89. He's been performing for 85 years. Yeah, he's he's a he's a you're watching like he's he's a legend. He's a treasure, and so he, and he kind of walks you through those stories, and he shows these classic clips that you've never seen before with him and Dean, and talks a little bit about how he did what he did, and you know the guy's just it's it's unbelievable. Yeah. But you you never that bug really never leaves you. He's still you know I said to him why eighty nine, and he's like I just have more to say. Right, and I'm like I get it. Yeah, me too. Uh, you know, he and Dean together were probably. The most electric act uh -huh. in history. And there's right down the street where the Hard Rock is, this is the old Paramount. And there's this picture of them hanging out the window with thousands of girls just going ape shit. Yes. You know, like like they were the Beatles yeah. of their time. Do you think they ever played the Rathskeller? No. <laughs> oh, shit. No. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> Although. <laughs> no. <laughs> Killing me. Yeah. You, um,. So you found yourself in this position, but... We, we, that always sounds bad when you say is. that, right? That's well, a horrible way to start off. You found yourself in this position. How did you get there? How well, did you... so everything hmm. that was rough for you wasn't really career stuff. The career was going great. But then illness, life stuff happens. Uh, although you never set yourself up for a family member you know, embezzling. Oh, yeah. I mean, so that's got to feel Betrayal. like... Betrayal. So, yeah. yeah, it was, and that was on the you know, on the heels of, you know, my parents. So it was like a one, two, three punch. How, how do you even find out something like that? How do you? I was changing. I was moving my business out uh, to the West Coast. I bought a home there and I, you know, called my, he's my half brother, but I called him up and I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I need to do this right. I need to keep things on the up and up. So my business needs to be out of where I'm a resident of. And uh, he wasn't really interested in sending the file cabinet, so to speak. <laughs> And I, I didn't, you know, really think at first. I love my brother. I never yeah. had a really. We never had even a, a poor word to say about each other. Um, he was a seemingly just kind of like, you know, regular nice guy. And when finally I demanded, you know, you got to send this stuff out, it it all came to light. And it was, uh, yeah, it was just ugly. It was really uh, an unbelievable, you know, uh, it kind of like I remember the day that it happened and turning to my then girlfriend and I was like, I think my brother stole like all my money. And I just remember her looking at me like, what? Yeah, I've never heard you talk about him like that. It was like an epiphany. It all just made sense. So I had to deal with that and go through the legal ramifications. And But I'll, I will tell you something, and, and I don't care if it comes across as uh, you know corny. or I was in dire straits that year. And I told my manager, I said, I'm going to put a tour together of these arenas because I did the HBO show. And I said, and, I, and I'm already you know commanding these large crowds. I said, I'm going to book 80 arenas this year, and uh, and I had to pay for that. I actually, like most of these places, people don't realize, I rented them myself. So I had to kind of go even further into what I felt was like the whole. And my fans saved my life because everything I did that year, I, I got back what I lost. I got my nest egg back. I paid, I kept the house that I just bought that I thought I was going to lose. And it's because of that year and uh, that, that connection that I had, you know, with, with my fans that I was like, I will never do something again 
that I don't feel is completely true and the best of what I can give to them to entertain people. So isn't that weird? It's kind of weird. It's like, I wouldn't want that to happen again. I wouldn't wish that on anybody, but it gave me something that I didn't have before, you know, a deeper uh, gratitude. And so that's why Troublemaker is what it is because right. it's just all me, all passion from my heart. And I just want you to laugh your asses off for an hour and a half. That's all I want. But that's also interesting of what happens when bad things happen in the way you deal with it. Like you find out that there's more blessings than you imagine having, but you only know that because you didn't lock up, you didn't freeze or yeah. feel sorry for yourself. Yeah, no, no. Sometimes, you know, you got to get, uh, you know, the. It, it, I did a movie with Kevin Costner years ago called Mr. Brooks. And uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank yeah. you. No, I felt, I felt, I felt yeah. like there was a, they didn't, there was a mental parry thrust with myself they, in the crowd. They've all been drinking quite a bit. I you guess guys, so, yeah. It's the... Nooners. Yeah, it's all Nooners. And Kevin Costner said something really wonderful one day. He said a lot of great stuff. That, that's a smart man right there. But he said, uh, he saw that I was, you know, kind of heavy hearted. This was, I was doing the movie in and around this whole time. And he said, let me tell you something, man. When you take big bites out of the universe, the universe takes big bites out of you. And I was like, I'm going to keep taking big bites out of the universe. You know, it's, it's, I'd rather be able to do that and, uh, uh, reach more people and have a little bit more fun uh, as long as you'll have me and uh, so he, he says sometimes it's like a receipt for all the the good things that happen yeah it's like you know uh, whatever the pendulum does swing both ways and I've yeah. been very fortunate and then like anybody I've had you know bad stuff happen and so it's uh it's no different from anybody else. Sometimes it may seem like because I'm in the spotlight, but truly it's like I feel the same stuff anybody else does. And I know I just want to ultimately protect my family, protect my my home and mm -hmm. get back to work and just do what I enjoy. That's all. And have a non-relative keep an eye on your money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, now you my money. An I keep you have my an aunt <laughs> doing it now. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's buried under a bush. It's very safe now. I've, I've got a little treasure map that I've made up. It's like it's real security now. <laughs> You said you've been through this banking machine, and a lot of that has to do with stuff online and stuff you've had to deal with yes. as well. Uh, I always see, for me, it's always you and John Mayer seem to be, <laughs> if you, for anyone who's like not your fan, then you catch shit from people who aren't. We should go on know? tour together. You I really should. Like because John Mayer's the same way. He's always the nicest guy, the funniest guy. Absolutely. Big hit songs. And then you hear people, they're just like, fuck John Mayer. And you're like, where does that come from? What is that? Because he has a hot girlfriend? I mean, what happened there? Uh, he does. So you yeah. know what? Fuck John Mayer. Yeah, he is. He does have a hot girlfriend. Yeah. I kind of hate him right now, too. <laughs> yeah. Wait a minute. It's starting to make sense. Yeah. <laughs> but you've had to deal with some, like, the people who aren't your fans. And your fans are... Sure. You've got as many fans as anybody who's ever had doing stand-up. Right. But then there's some kind of anger towards that <laughs> from other people. Yeah, I don't know. It's, uh, I don't know if it was just coming up, you know, through the internet age that I was so... People knew that they could, you know, get to me. I was right there. Mm -hmm. I was always, you know, kind of like in the matrix, so to speak, like hanging out with people. I don't know if that was alluring for... You know, the, the it, it's a culture, hater culture. I don't right. know if that was like, like he's right in here with us, you know, and I can be anonymous and get shoulder to shoulder with him. I don't know if it was that. I don't know if it was because I was, I found success at a young age. I think sometimes that irks people. Um, and so maybe just those things coupled together, uh, I found myself as a target. Um, but some of it I understood as well because I was like, you know, riding down the street one day, seeing a billboard for something else I did, I was like, man, I'm, I'm sure people need a break from me because I honestly was tired of seeing my own face places. And I'm like, I can only imagine what somebody who doesn't know me and know my, my passion or drive. Uh, so I never, I've never really fought it. I mean, that's the one thing you'll see about me. I never uh, was calling up morning DJs and trying to like, you know, send fiery arrows back at people yeah. because I kind of sort of enjoy it. Because <laughs> I was a very um, non-confrontational kid, I dealt with a lot of uh, social anxiety. I had like uh, anxiety attacks, panic attacks. I was always afraid of other um, kids in school. I just had like this. I just had uh, a lot of you know emotional stuff. I had a phobic mom as well too. So growing up, like I think maybe just absorbing some of her phobias, even when she was pregnant with me, she was. Um, uh, you know, what's that when you can't leave the house? She dealt with that. Agoraphobic. Uh, yeah, agoraphobic. So 
I think that I was just this sensitive kid and I never dreamed in a million years that I could be like a gunslinger type. Right. I was never going to be that guy who kicked in the saloon doors and people are going to be like, he's back. <laughs> but I like it. And I like it for putting my business hat on. It's, gr it's great to be discussed. It's great to be um, uh, controversial because then your fans are just so hearty and excited behind you. And then you've got... Uh, you know, haters coming in, and sometimes they're actually really entertaining. And some of the thing, you know, some of them are just you know batshit crazy. But then some of their stuff is actually like interesting and and uh, and kind of funny. So I always step back and just let that happen. It's not always the most enjoyable when your fans or your family are reading those things and seeing sure. it. But for me personally, I think that uh, it's a route in my life I never thought I would uh, be you know moving towards, which is like, wow, I guess I'm I'm. You know, I'm kind of a, um, a polarizing guy, but that seems to keep things interesting. And it, does it ever happen to you in life or is it just online and and places like that? Do people walk up to you? A guy, never. First yeah. of all, never, never, never. People, I don't know, people just won't be like that to your face. But one time a guy actually walked me through these. He goes, he goes I want to tell you something, man. He goes, I used to love you. <laughs> and then for a while, man. I really hated you. <laughs> and then I watched you again, and I kind of liked you. <laughs> and after this show tonight, man, I got to tell you, I'm back, man. <laughs> and I was like, well, I never went anywhere, so thanks. <laughs> it's so funny. It's kind of wild, man. Yeah. It's, it's okay, but I do really feel like it's all love and it's, it's in some way or another. And one other you know, a quick story, if you have time sure. for it, is I, I, I had a... I've talked about like uh, in, in a past routine about I would get this letter from Anonymous and uh, this guy really cut me down to size and he would like write these uh, really caustic reviews of whatever I did. I could never do right by this guy. He would always write me from the same email address and it was scathing. It was like when, I, when, I, when it came into my inbox, even the, like the chime, I knew <laughs> it was instead of being like light and delightful, it was like ding. <laughs> and so this guy would always, uh, you know, he would just, you know, take me to task. And it was just everything, every reason I should quit and why I was just horrible for comedy and bad for business and a bad human being and everything else. And after several years of back and forth, because I would try to get his goat and I would write Ooh. him and, and tell him why I was awesome or whatever it was. <laughs> and try to feel awesome. And this went back and forth for quite a bit. And then I ended up talking about him in, in one of my routines. I think I read one of the letters that he... And then he actually wrote a review about me reading his letter and he just <laughs> tore me to shreds. But I'm not even kidding. It wasn't even from like, oh, he must have been like a comic who was like... He, it was, it was like, I have all these letters still. They are like, they're like, you would read them and be like, oh man, sorry. I'm sorry. Like, you know, just really personal. Brutal. Anyway, then a, a period of time came, I didn't get any letters from this guy, but I'd figured out what his Facebook was. Um, and I went to his Facebook page. I knew actually a couple of years before, but I went back to his Facebook page and he, he passed away. Yep. All, all these people. <laughs> This they feel bad. I know, right? <laughs> Look at this. Everyone. Oh. They didn't offer me when I said both my parents passed away they in nine months. I didn't even get one fucking off. <laughs> you sons of bitches. No more beers for these guys. Seriously. I so <laughs> that was great. That's life right there. Yeah. So so I see his sister, everybody's writing their condolences and stuff, and I see his sister's account on there, the same last name. So I wrote her. And I said, I'm really sorry that your brother passed away. You know, uh, he wrote me a lot of letters <laughs> for the last uh, eight years, nine days. And, you know, <laughs> and she wrote me back and she said, first of all, um, that that's really sweet of you to uh, reach out like this. And second of all, my brother really hated you <laughs> a lot. <laughs> And I think he would find reason to think this was as atrocious <laughs> somehow. <clears throat> and it was, uh, I, I kind of miss the guy. I really sure. do. It's weird. He was a horrible human being to me. I just wonder what's on his tombstone. You know what I mean? Fuck Dane Cook. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> He just never let go. He never let go. Oh, he couldn't. I'm glad I brought him some enjoyment. Yeah. I think he really liked writing me those letters. So rest in peace, my friend. Or not my friend. Well, before the internet, you never would have 
found out who doesn't like you. Like, I'm sure there were plenty of people that didn't like Johnny Carson. They just didn't watch his fucking show. Right. You know? Sure. Well, you know, yeah. there was no way to reach him. Nope. That's it. Know? Just turn, turn the, you know, turn the channel. And, yeah. and, and the thing is, too, it's like, you know, coming that era of like even before Internet and all that, it was, uh, you know, because the 90s was really not great for comedy. Remember, yeah. it was like, you know, the boom ended. It was oversaturated. There's a lot of people who thought they could do comedy. And there was just it was it was a weird terrain out there for a while. And it and, and it even made, you know, some great comics not stick to it because they just weren't getting the credit they they deserved. Um, so I was really happy once I stumbled upon the. The, the internet and uh, and and wanting to use it in the way that I saw these old punk bands using like flyers and putting them up on telephone poles I was like oh man okay I could probably use this thing as like to find you know like a grassroots following and I'll just digitally do what the posters are stapled to the the telephone pole and I will shake everybody's hand one instant message at a time and send them a link and try to get them into my stuff uh, and that was that was really how it started I remember my first you know, fan writing me. I still have the, fr I still have all, I have every email anybody's ever sent me. I keep everything. I have every letter. I have, uh, you know, fan letters. I have military. I've always corresponded with our, our troops and, and I have all those back and forths. I have, uh, you know, haters. Yeah. <laughs> I have, if, if you find me dead, start with these people here <laughs> folder. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's been fascinating, but I have those first, you know, initial, uh, correspondence. And those were the ones that made me think like, well, okay. I got five more fans on a Tuesday than I did yesterday. And I did it sitting in my underwear, eating fruit loops, uh, you know, waiting 23 hours to go on stage for nine people at, uh, you know, two in the morning. I think I'll stick to stick to this. Was there a point where you just started to see it working that the people were coming out again or bringing friends or was that a gradual or was it a tipping point? I did. There was, I really, uh, I had gone, there was a place in Houston called the laugh stop. I went to the laugh stop in, uh, 2000 and they had the, uh, they had a dat recorder and that was like, you know, the state of the art technology for recording audio. And I asked them, can I, can I bring, you know, some dat tapes or whatever down? And I recorded this set and I went home and I had a friend who worked at, uh, premier radio and we used to sneak in on the weekends so I could uh, fashion together this this set and we put this whole set together and uh, then I listened to it and I was like man there's too many uh, too many uh, I, I can swear right yeah. I was like there's too many fucks uh, and, and so I go can we cut some of those out and so then we went and like meticulously like remove because it was so many once we put it together it was distracting and so we took a bunch of those out and this ended up being harmful of swallowed this was my first uh, album and I sold it, you know, out of my trunk and I sold it at shows and that got around college campuses. And then I remember the next year going and instead of, oh, you're going to play, you know, the, whatever, the Rathskeller, or you're going to be in like the, in the cafeteria, you know, in the middle of noon, they'd be like, oh, like 1500 people want to come see you. How did you do that? You're not on television. You're not on, you're not on Saturday Night Live or whatever. And that's when I knew. I was like, this internet thing, it's my secret path, man. I'm going to, I'm going down underneath while everybody's <laughs> up there trying to, you know, figure it out. I'm, I'm going to stick down here underground style. I love that you stole all the production for it, too. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> Just sneaking into places. Yeah, that was editing it. Editing fast. Yeah, you know, and I came up with Harmful of Swallowed, the title, because while we were editing, I went to use the bathroom one day, and and there was like a little kind of like all the uh, solvents and everything, and mm -hmm. on the shelf in front of me was a, a dangerous solvent and it said Harmful of Swallowed. <laughs> and so I went back in. I was like, I got the title. <laughs> So you even stole that from them. That's it. Everything came out of that, <laughs> that uh, tiny little crappy radio station. Well, then there became that time where people decided, yeah, he is legitimate. And you did get to do Saturday Night Live. I and did. always remember that you were you going out, your monologue must have been the longest in history. I mean, you did a real big piece of stand up. Of yeah. Lauren life. Michaels was, uh, he was pretty adamant about me doing stand up when I finally did the show he he was like i want you to do stand-up out there i wanted to do the sketches and whatever sing a crazy song and, you yeah. know they always kind of do yeah. something with the with the that you know awesome cast and i he was like no i want you to do stand-up and i want you to really dig in and do something that uh you know that's uh that's really you you're you know bring out your edgiest you know and have a lot of fun he was he was so uh he he was he was really wonderful with me. I felt immediately like uh, like he was going to protect me, uh, whatever I was about to do out there. And I think I ended up doing a, a, a pretty. I did a bit about suicide that was mm -hmm. like 
really the network was not they came into my dressing room and slammed the door they were like you're not doing that material <laughs> like screaming at me and uh you know lauren michaels was just like you know i'll take care of it i got it and he really protected me allowed me to go out there and do something that was um of the show and especially of the past performers that were on there so i would say in my life that that uh you know if you took away my my comedy entertainment license today i could always say man i got to do snl and very few people got to to host that show from a stand up position. You know? In six months earlier, I, I had a conversation with Lauren Michaels here in New York, and I said uh, because we talked about me p possibly joining the cast the way Billy Crystal yeah. had done is almost like a stunt year or something like that. We were bouncing around ideas, and I I said to him during that meeting, I go, I go, I go Lauren, let me host, and he goes, No. Absolutely not gonna <laughs> not gonna happen. I go, why? You used to have Carl and a prior and you know Steve Martin and you know, all these guys and he was like, you know, he just he was like, nope, it's not that show now and you know it, it's and I'm, you know okay, that's it's your gig. And then Retaliation came out and when it hit number four on the Billboard charts, he called me. I was in my hotel room in Vegas getting ready for the Vegas Comedy Festival. Picked up the phone. He goes, hey, it's Lauren Michaels. I go, what? And he goes, you're hosting Saturday Night Live. Wow. And it was like, wow, yeah. wow. It's Saturday Night Live. <laughs> oh. That's amazing, though. It's amazing. Yeah, it's uh, you know, there's definitely some uh, some dream come true moments that have uh, yeah. you know been in here along the way. And all I'm about now, man, is I want to help other people find that. I want to help other artists to keep that integrity. To not, uh, you know, that's why I'm talking about these young guys that I get to, you know, uh, you know, I don't, I don't like advice. I don't give advice. I don't mm -hmm. tell you how to do anything. Your act or whatever. It's like you find that yourself. But I will help you to protect yourself off stage so everything you do on there is fucking yours and not some manager whispering this is what gets you the deal or the tv show or you shouldn't wear those uh you know those pants or like no 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 no. whatever you're feeling at the time even if it's you know the wrong thing you gotta learn that on your own as mm -hmm. a performer so that's you know I, I like being able to take these things that i've done and accomplished and hopefully turn them into something good to watch somebody else uh, get up at bat is that something you always knew you wanted to do or yep. is it something just coming around? Yeah, Yeah, no, no, I, I did. You know, I, my, my dad growing up was a, uh, he, he was a, he was a tough son of a bitch. He, he was a bit of a ham uh, and he had, a, you know, he had a good sense of humor, but he was always, um, he always had like lumber companies and businesses like window businesses. He always had some new business going. And I was, uh, I was intimidated by him because I never thought I had a, I never thought I could do business. I actually thought I was just like, oh, I can just be funny. But he, I, you know, he went to BC. He was just a really bright guy, and I, I just, I didn't think I could compare to this. Uh, he was an enormous figure to me. And uh, but I remember having a conversation with him one day, and where I knew that we were connected was he was like, he was like, uh, he had a window business. He was like, Dang, come here, come outside. I want to show you something. And he goes, look at my sign. He goes, the sign I painted. And he goes. It's orange and white. You know why it's orange and white? I said, no. And he goes, look at the other signs all the way up and down the street. I look around the signs. And I go, I don't get it. What? And he goes, they're all blue. They're <laughs> going to see my sign. And he loved self-promotion. And he loved protecting ideas. Uh, and I knew right away that's, uh, you know, he had a, he had a, a nightclub called the one, two club. And, uh, cause he was a former boxer and he, he said, Dane, Dane, you know why? Look at this. You know why I have these, uh, little hassocks, like those little short seats. He goes, you know, why I have these hassocks instead of the stools. I go, why? And he goes, cause the girls sit down in their skirts <laughs> and then the guys come in because they know where this is where the legs are at. If you know what I'm saying? So he always was thinking of a way to brand. Yeah. And he said to me one day, the words I'll never forget, Dane, nothing attracts a crowd like a crowd. And in doing that, I, I just want to be able to impart and to help other people to figure out how do you feel like you can attract a crowd that will then attract a crowd. That's kind of like what I want to do for the next you know, phase of my life is figure out how to help other people keep that. You know, it's important for me to see that as a fan of some of the, you know, these are funny, you know, people that I see. And, and, and I want to, I don't know, I'd like to be able to help them with what I've you know, garnered and, and be able to kind of, you know, see if I can help them figure it out too. It's also strange that you're now a bridge from the guys that you knew. Oh, I thought I was really a bridge somewhere. No, you're a bridge, yeah. Oh, I was going to be like, they named a bridge after me? <laughs> yeah. No, wow. but you're a bridge between those older comics like <laughs> Cosby and Lewis and all them and these younger guys. You know, there's not, there's not too many guys that have hit those kind of heights that you've had. Cosby's going out and played the big places yeah yeah it's uh you know i listen i i 
I've uh, I've had that you know opportunity you know in working on Troublemaker to I've had to really look back on a lot of stuff you know to figure out like what I want to hone and uh, a lot of appreciation for what I've been l lucky fortunate and you know worked my butt off to do um, but having had a chance to sit with a Bill Cosby, you know, I got to meet Bill Cosby who was hosting Letterman one night when Letterman was sick. I was the comic and, uh, and Bill Cosby came into my dressing room. We got to sit and, you know, I got to, I got to meet my heroes. I got to work with a lot of these, uh, Robin Williams. I was, you know, hanging with the laugh factor in the laugh factory with him. And, uh, he was gracious enough to, you know, talk to me a little bit. And, you know, I, I, I feel like I learned from the best. I got to, you know, really uh, toil around in the background and watch the best of the best do what they do. And the fact that I'm in any way, um, you know, in tandem with that is, uh, I'm very grateful. Very grateful. Robin was one of those guys who got to do everything. Yeah, he did. And he also, you know, if you met him, he was, he was kind of like slight. There was something very, uh, you know, fragile almost about him. Mm -hmm. I remember standing next to him and I'm not even kidding you. I watched him at the Laugh Factory one night. He came in and he was just, he was very, you know, uh, timid and, you know, to himself and just, he very, just again, small. But when he hit the stage, he grew. I'm telling you, he got bigger. He, he got, he was physically, I'm like looking, I'm like, is this like an illusion? What is he? He was big. He got big and he filled up that entire room. You know, it's, uh, he was an incredible, incredible, uh, performer. And, uh, you know, I dedicated the special to him. And actually you may have seen that at the end. Yeah. My special is dedicated to Robin Williams. Well, you know, you talked about you being an anxious kid. He was an anxious, shy kid. And a lot of people cannot believe that when they see you or he perform because there's so much energy and so much confidence. Uh, well, being he, you know, thank you, but being on stage, uh, you know, something clicks yeah. in, in a performer, you know, whatever that, uh, you know, that other side of them can come out. But I will tell you, I could stand in front of, you know, 20,000 people. I can play an arena and I feel fine. But when I walk back to that meet and greet and my manager's like, you got 25 people in there. I'm like, okay, 25, 25. Okay, is everybody nice? Are they all nice? Is everybody like in a... <laughs> I still, I'm still yeah. that kid, man. It's like, I'm not shy like I used to be. I can, you know, uh, put myself together. But uh, yeah, that stuff never goes away. It's still kind of always in there when you're, before you hit the, you know, the, the, the white hot spotlight brings it out of you. Yeah. Man. And you know, when you were bringing up about that hole, I, I'm, I guess that was Robin's thing too. I guess there was something, whatever that emptiness is that, you know. Well, I was, fortu I was fortunate enough to talk to Rick Overton, who is really, really good, good Great. friends with uh, Robin. And I had him up to the house recently just to, you know, hang with the guy because I obviously know how hard he took it. And, you know, that's what he was talking about. He's like, you know, that uh, you didn't really see it coming. Um, you know, you, we, we all have our, you know, our issues. It's kind of what makes some performers tick is uh, I think Jason Reitman. I just he was do, uh, advertising his uh, new film. And I said, why, why Sandler? He put Sandler and he said, because uh, comics know trauma and trauma is drama. And, uh, it, you know, if you can get a great performance, and obviously Robin Williams, so many, the performance is right in the eyes. He allowed us to see that side of him. Have you seen uh, Reitman's uh, movie, Men, Women, and Children? No, I want to see it. He, uh, there's a scene that Sandler plays anxious, laying in bed, and it's almost too painful to look at. You're uh -huh. like, he knows what that place is like yeah you know? yeah i think we yeah we definitely we do we yeah. do we all have that in common you know we know what it's like to be there's a lot of sacrifice in this in this career and uh that's why i always tell people you know you support live comedy keep going to those clubs because those young guys uh, trust me they're they're scared man they're out there hoping that they're going to find their fans even if it's just to be able to make a living for themselves and to come across to somebody to connect with somebody so i say what i always said which is you know get out to those clubs and tell somebody you, you like them comics need to hear it don't be yeah. afraid even though we might skulk away and be like oh yeah thanks no 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 trust me it it matters write your write your local comic and let them know <laughs> if there's a piece of material you dig trust me um vulnerability always plays into that i think and when you did Louis, when you did that show with Louis C.K., and there was uh, the performing that you guys did where we couldn't tell how much was true and how much was performing was really a television highlight. Oh, I mean, thank you. It was you. really, really great. Thanks. Yeah, Louis, that's all written. That was all written by Louis. Uh, I think some people think maybe we imp improvised it or uh, were off the cuff, but it was verbatim. 
it's what he wanted us to talk about and i was i was totally down to you know to come in and participate with that but that was all his point of view then that is true. Yes. So you would have to say at some point. Are you trying to drum something up here, no, Ron? No, no. Just... Oh, boy. Because there's an episode that I'd like to write. <laughs> yeah, right. And put Louie in a scene. <laughs> right. Right. I just performed with Louie, too, uh, the last couple of weekends down at the Comedy Cellar. And, I, I, I you know, he's – I've always loved Louie. And mm. he's uh, – you know, it was uh, kind of a strange period. And it, and it became everybody's, even though that was something that normally two comics would hash out. Uh, if that was an issue at the back of a club somewhere on sure. any given night, you'll see two comics being like, dude, I do a bit about so-and-so. <laughs> uh, it just, it was, I think it was so new for the internet to be able to chime in and have a say that when he called and finally was like, yeah, this is like ours to own. And I think we should put it to bed. I was, I was really uh, excited to finally be able to have that moment with him. It, it was, it was exciting. You know, that's uh, I'd like to work with him again in another capacity, just seeing how he directed and, and what he came up with that day. Were you surprised in, in the in the way that he drove? I mean, the, it was one thing to see it, but another thing to be there with him. Uh, yeah, it, it was probably another factor even into Troublemaker. When I see comics, uh, you know, at the at the helm of their own creativity, it uh, it's really enticing, and it uh, it's it's something that um, I you know I, even that day it was like even though we were you know dealing with something that was seemingly a heavier you know topic truly i was sitting there watching how he worked with his crew and uh the respect that was there you know vice versa and and uh you know i i just admired that he was doing that and you know it's a testament the show is the show is what it is because well, it's i also fluid. think and again i mean what you brought to that though what you were willing to do and i do agree with you that right. it's never fair to play <laughs> one person's point of view right but, but at that point it also it didn't matter it was so yeah. like it so it was so uh it was like an amoeba at that point there were so yeah. many different opinions and takes and it was so far from really what it was that uh it, it it wasn't like this has to be exactly how you and i feel it really was just about putting us together and yeah. allowing us to have closure in some way and i i thought it was brilliant or i wouldn't have I wouldn't have done it if i didn't think it was something that was really uh special especially for for television well you know like we talked about the guys that you start with those are the guys that you measure yourself against forever for good or bad you know those are the yeah. guys that you're like I know Robert Kelly is a friend of yours and oh, yeah. there's things popping for him now, which is just great. But it's always like those are the guys that you're kind of always looking at of from the side of your eyes too. Yeah, yeah. No, you're, it's it, this thing in comedy. It's it's competitive. Yeah. You know, you're always checking out the guy next to you in the lane next to you. And, uh, you know, part of you is going like, especially comics, like, how come he got that? And why can't I do that? Right. You know, it's it's there's a lot of, you know, woe is me. And, uh, you know, it's, it's it can be frustrating. And yet we're, I think that at the end of the day, anytime a comic succeeds, especially like Louie and that, that was going to be great for every comic because the right. success of that show is going to make more suits upstairs who really don't have much of an idea go, well, I guess comics know what to do with themselves. Yeah. So when you see a comic have a breakthrough moment like that, and whether it's been, you know, Seinfeld or, you know, however many comics have, have been able to Roseanne and, and, you know, it goes on and on, then that's, that's great for comedy business right there. Well, you, um, you, you're directing, producing and all, and I'm dancing. Yeah, you're dancing, you're singing, <laughs> you're writing books, you're painting. It ne it's just it just flows from you now. Uh, but that's that's part of the fun of this, right? It really is. Yeah, just trying something you know new and uh, and finding the opportunity and the people that uh, you know get behind you and go. You know what? We you know we like your voice. Right. We want to help you too. Again, like I'm talking about with some of these young comics, like we want to help you to protect that. So I think with Troublemaker. Um, I hope you forget all of this. My goal is that you see none of it. I mm -hmm. want it to be that you just are laughing, and then I will know that I uh, aesthetically and all the other little you know things that I tweaked um, will that'll be uh, very rewarding. That you say like, oh, I didn't yeah really care about any of that. I just thought it was funny. Well, that means I executed it in a way that uh, you know connected with people at home. Well, the first time in four years, just like when the Olympics roll around every four years. <laughs> Dane Cook, everybody. There he oh, is. Right. Troublemaker. Showtime. Thank you so much, Dane. Thanks, that was great, buddy. Thank you.